We are on week five of our detox series. There's one week to go. That's next Sunday when we land. And I don't know about you, but we, man, I have been, I haven't been as proud of, as this to be part of this local church as I have been over this, over this series. Uh, I get to rave about it because I'm not the guy who did the videos and all the prep on the, for the, the midweek talks. That's, that's Steve. But God gave this church this, this idea, and uh, Steve, along with the rest of a, a large team, have put together an incredible series. And uh, just to see the lives that have been impacted, the number of people who have come to faith in Christ over the last couple of weeks has been amazing. And so could we celebrate that? And let's just thank Jesus. Let's give him a round of applause for what he's done in and through the series. <clears throat> I think it has been absolutely amazing. And well done to the team. This booklet is fantastic. If you have your booklet here, the notes to, if you want to take some notes and jot down some scripture, we're going to throw out quite a lot of scripture this morning. And uh, that's on page 70, if you've got your booklets here. It's on page 70. And I get the privilege of sharing on week five, and the topic is detox your friendships. Detox your friendships. Our underlying text for this series has been at Hebrews 12, 1 to 3. And so before I dive into detox your friendships, let me remind you of what it is. Here we go. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And uh, what an amazing scripture. And just to kick off, isn't it amazing that God has planned out things for our lives? Paul tells in Ephesians 2 that we are his workmanship uh, uh, created in Christ Jesus for good works that he wants us to enjoy and walk in. It's like the Father's put together a tailor-made life for you and I. When he is knitting us together, he designed this race, this incredible journey, and there's things for us to do. And so this idea of detox and getting rid of all the stuff that slow us down because we want to enjoy everything that God has for us. Amen? All right, so detoxing your friendships and keeping with this text, it's this idea that the type of friendships that we have will have impact and influence and somewhat determine the way in which we finish, finish Sorry, this incredible race. Let me say that again. The friendships we have, the people we spend most of our time with, we allow them to actually have impact and influence into this race that we have. And it will impact how much of this incredible journey we get to enjoy. And it will impact how we finish. And we all want to finish well. There's a great saying that says this, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And so this idea of detoxing your friendships is taking an honest look this morning at the people you spend most of your time with. Now, if I could just add in a little thing there, we're not saying that you can't be friends across the board. Of course, we want to make disciples of all nations. That was the great commission to us, Matthew 28. And we want to go out, so we need to make friends with everyone, our neighbors, people. We need to go share the gospel. This morning, I'm referring to those people that you spend most of your time with. There's a great... Um, there's a great quote by Jim Ron. I've loved this quote for many, many years. He says this, you become the average of the five people you spend the most time with. I'll say that again. You become the average, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So choose wisely. What an interesting quote. And the text that backs it up, Proverbs 12, 26 says this, the righteous choose their friends carefully but the way of the wicked leads them astray. And here's the trap. We all think that we could join a group of friends or hang out with certain people, and we think that we will lift the average. We think, don't worry, it's okay, it's all good. I can hang out with these guys, and I'll lift the average. Well, the reality is that we, we, if we're not careful, we start to become the average. Paul warns us in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, he says, guys, don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. I love those words, don't be misled. He's saying, careful. Hey, guys, careful. There's this great race marked out for you. There's this wonderful life God's planned for you. Be careful. Don't be misled. You're not going to lift the average. You will generally become the average of the company you keep. Proverbs 22, verse 24 to 25 says this. Do not make friends with, hot -tempered, with a hot-tempered person. Do not associate with one easily angered. So you could put any, any bad quality in place of that. But it says, and it says, or you may learn their ways and get yourself ensnared. So if you look at what Paul said, what comes out in this proverb, Paul's saying, guys, be careful. Don't be misled. Don't fool yourself. And in this proverb saying, or you may learn their ways. We'll start to pick up those character traits of the people around us. So we've got to choose 
wisely. When I was growing up, uh, I was reminded, just in preparing for this morning, God reminded me of a time when I finished my trick and I went on our matric holiday, matric rave, and we were camping down in some quasi part of that whole North Coast thing. And, uh, and I realized on that matric holiday that the company I was, I, I was keeping, this group of friends, and I, I'm not putting the onus on them, we weren't a great influence on each other, myself included. It was high energy, surf, play hard, party hard, go for it. And I remember on one morning, early in the morning, we had a couple of late nights, and I remember God pulled me aside, and just in some quiet time with God, not a quiet time, just God pulled me aside, and while I was quiet, uh, I remember God saying to me, my boy, it's time to choose. It's time to choose. And I was thinking, wait, man, and I grew up in a Christian home, went to a lovely church. I knew God, I'd given my life to him, but in my high school years, had gone and done my own thing. And, uh, and I remember this holiday, God just laying out saying, my boy, there's a wide gate. You can follow the crowd, but here's the trajectory of where that's going, and it was a path of destruction. And he said, but there is a narrow gate. Steve spoke about this at the beginning of the series. There's a narrow gate, and it's with me, but it's going to require you to choose and make some adjustments in your life. Your friends is the first thing you need to adjust. You and your friends aren't a great influence on each other. In his kindness, I did a gap year out at Spirit of Adventure, and so I actually couldn't see many people, so I had a year to kind of sort things out. And in coming out, there were some friends waiting for me on the other side. It wasn't these group of friends from high school. It was actually some mates that I'd grown up with from a young age, from little guys. And these guys had stayed committed to local church, had, had walked through. They're part of this youth, actually, in this church. And I remember coming out of that gap year and thinking, well, I need to go and actually go and rebuild some friend, friendship circle, something of a friendship circle. And God in His kindness, there were these guys who pulled me in. I don't know why they thought to be friends with me. I wouldn't have been wa- wanted to be friends with me, to be honest. And these guys were there, and they pulled me in, and they, they pointed me to Jesus. And forever, to this day, I'm so grateful to those couple of guys. There's a a, a set of brothers and a couple of other boys. And I'm so grateful to those guys. They pointed me to Jesus. And although I knew the Lord, they actually saved my life and me making a big recommitment to God and diving back into the local church and my relationship with Jesus. So we've got to choose wisely the company that we keep. Choose wisely those people we spend most of our time with. It might be three people for you. It might be five or six people depending on your, your lifestyle and capacity. But, uh, but the people we choose to spend the most time with has huge impact on our lives. Is that good? Are we all still there? So the, the text I'd like to jump into is an Old Testament text. It's from 1 Samuel chapter 23. And it's a story about David. If you're unfamiliar with, with David, this is as a little guy, he went to slayed Goliath. Remember David and Goliath? And uh, at the age of 15, uh, roughly 15 the prophet Samuel anoints David as the next king over all of Israel. Between 15 and 30, when he becomes king, he serves under, the king, under King Saul. King Saul had a, had a son by the name of Jonathan, and Jonathan and David became great friends. They became great buddies. But David was this golden boy. He, everything he touched turned to gold. He was this great strategist in, uh, in war. He had slain Goliath. Uh, the people just loved him. They chanted after him, oh, David, he's killed the ten thousands. And uh, Saul became incredibly jealous about da- over David and envied David and the popularity that he was starting to, to get with the people. And so much so that he tried to kill David. It, it actually drove Saul mad. And King Saul devoted a lot of his time and energy and even soldiers to chase after David from place to place. And David was on the run. And we pick up the story in chapter 23, and it says this. So David and his men, about 600 in number, left Kali and kept moving from place to place. When Saul was told that David escaped from Kalah, he did not go there. David stayed in the wilderness strongholds and in the hills of the desert of Ziph. Day after day, Saul searched for him, but God did not give David into his hands. And here's the part we're going to focus on this morning. While David was at Horesh in the desert of Ziph, he learned that Saul had come out to take his life. So Saul was out to kill him again. And Saul's son, Jonathan, verse 16, went to David at Horesh and helped him find strength in God. Don't be afraid, he said. My father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You will be king over Israel, and I will be second to you. Even my father Saul knows this. The two men made a covenant before the Lord, a friendship a covenant before the Lord. Then Jonathan went home, but David remained at Horesh. My first point this morning out of this text is this. Everyone needs friendship and camaraderie. David was a man after God's own heart. He killed Goliath as a young boy. He was a skilled soldier. He, was, he, he would have, we assume that he 
uh, was superior to Jonathan in strength, intelligence, and theological understanding. So he was this main guy. But verse 16 says that it was Jonathan who went out and strengthened David. He went out to David, and it says in verse 18, they made a covenant of friendship before the Lord. Even this great man, David, who became king over all of Israel, even he needed friendship. You see, we were all designed, you and I, were, we were, God has created us, He's designed us to be in relationship, firstly with Him, and then with each other. Steve mentions, you'll see in the weekly talk, that we, we've got something, somewhat of an appetite, like we get hungry for food. We, God has designed us to have an appetite for, for, for communion, for, for friendship with other people. Um, the race marked out for us, while being an individual one, is not something to be done alone. And this is, this is something not for new believers, so it might, it's not just for those who've just put their faith in Christ. This is for everyone. And we ought never grow out of our need for daily encouragement, daily exhortation, daily friendship with people around us. There's a great, there's a great risk that we think we can do this alone. And in preparing, I was reminded of a great story. It's based on a true story. There's a movie made on the story called 127 Hours. It might ring a bell to some of you. But the story, it's a true story on a, on a, on a mountaineer by the name of Aaron Ralston. Now, Ian Rolston, he's, uh, he was this, this, this highly skilled mountain guide, and he's out in the, in the Canyonlands National Park, and this is where the story happens in Utah, in Blue Canyon Mountain. The story goes like this. He heads out, he packs his stuff, and on his own, he heads out on his mountain bike, he's got a backpack, I mean, it's really cool, and he heads out, and he's charging through these Canyonlands National Park, and he's heading off, he parks his bike after several k's against a tree, lashes it up, and he's now he's on foot, he's running, and he's jumping over these things, and he's just cruising through into this this, this massive open national park, this canyon lands. And, uh, and he's going along and he's having a whale of a time and, and it's so cool, he's diving through and there's these slots, these big cracks at the top is quite flat and these cracks that run down for hundreds of feet and he's, and he's sliding down these cracks, you know, using his feet and his hands to get down. And on one particular slot, one particular crack at the top, he, as he's going down, he dislodges a boulder, a giant boulder like this and him and the boulder start to slide down this crack and as they go down, the crack narrows like this and gets tighter and tighter. And, he, and these guys are picking up speed. And as they get near the bottom, him and the boulder stop. But the problem is this giant boulder has, has wedged his hand between the boulder and the rock and crushed it into place. Literally crushed it. Impossible to get out. And I mean, it's just as the dust settles, he realizes that he is in a huge amount of trouble. It's, he did, for the next five days, he's stuck. And the good news is, I'll tell you the end, he gets out. This is how he gets out. He has to ration his food. He has to, he has to wee into his camelback and drink his own urine to survive. He has to eventually break his own arm using a rope that he had with him. He breaks his arm off in the bottom of the canyon. He takes his pen knife that he's been trying to chisel away at the rock. That's now blunt. And he realizes he has to amputate his own arm. Okay, it's like severe. If you watch this movie, I tell you, you're sweating. It is so intense. But it's, it's, you'll see the point of the story. He amputates his arm, he has to rappel down, this is day five, he has to rappel down through this crack, he gets out, he's all delirious and hallucinating, and he, he fumbles around, and m miraculously, he bumps into a couple of other mountaineers, uh, who see him, he calls out, they, in the movie, they show he's, he's just blurry, and they call out, and, they, and they, they go and rescue him. In this story, and it's based on the actual video logs that he takes, he's got a little video camera, now he's going through day, night, day, night, rain, sunshine, etc., stuck in the bottom there on his own, he starts making a video of himself, and he says, great, sends a message to his mom, to his dad, saying, you know, I'm never going to see you again, you know, I'm sorry for this, thank you for that, etc., etc." On about day four, he starts hallucinating, and he starts getting a little bit uh, out of sorts, and so he, he pretends, or he thinks he's, at a, he's hosting a radio talk show host, he's a radio talk show host, he's bottom of the cannon, he says, welcome, and now he's videoing himself, and this is based on the actual true footage, he says, welcome to uh, the boulder, he calls it, the boulder radio talk show. I'm Aaron, and I'm, at, I'm in Loser Canyon. And he's starting to mock himself for being down there on his own. And he pretends that a caller's coming. He says, oh, here's a caller. And he says, hi there, welcome. He says, hi, it's Aaron. No ways, I'm also Aaron. And he says, so Aaron, and he asks these questions of himself. And he says, you know, did, did you tell anyone where you were going? And he says, no, because of my extreme selfishness and pride, I didn't tell anyone where, where I was going. And so even if they knew I was in trouble, they wouldn't be able to find me. Ha <laughs> ha, and he laughs at himself. There's this applause in the background. And he then mocks himself again. He says, well, how do you know so much about the mountain? And he says, well, I'm this rescue mountaineer, but let me tell you, I'm a hard-headed hero. And then he swears at himself a little bit. 
that basically I'm too good for everyone else. And so I went out on my own. And then the final thing he says, so can we assume that being a hard-headed hero full of pride, that this is what's led you to get into so much trouble? And he says, you're absolutely right. And looks into his own camera and says, oops, as the real footage. And he realizes that moment that there is no prizes for doing this life alone. And there's a sinking feeling. And, and in the documentary, in the story, he, you see the sinking, gut-wrenching feeling. There's no, there's, there's no prizes for being a hero. And uh, there's this great saying, it says, a lone ranger is a dead ranger. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 10. And it's interesting, in this, in this text, it says uh, that the little, the little underlining thing before the text starts says, oppression, toil, and friendlessness. That's the heading. And this is what it says in Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 10. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help up the other. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. If we don't want to be that guy stuck up the creek without a paddle, basically, with your arm ledged or wedged in the canyon, no one knows where you are, what you're going through, so they can't come and help you. This text in Ecclesiastes says, pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. This whole idea of detox is that we become more like Christ. Jesus himself modeled friendship so beautifully for us. We know that he all had the 12 disciples. One of them did betray him at the end. And so friendships, it does show us that friendships, we're still human. People will let you down. But let, let us not let that deter us away from the friendships we need. Jesus had the 12. It says he also had the, 20, the 72 who he appointed. They were his friends and he sent them out. Interestingly enough, he also, of the 12, there were three, Peter, James, and John. James and John were brothers that were like his close three guys. They were with him when he raised, did, did miracles where the others weren't present. He sowed extra time into these guys. These guys had a huge impact in the earlier church. When he, when he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead, these three guys were there. In the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus went out, in this, you can just imagine the anguish and the, 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 the anticipation of what was coming to be betrayed, crucified, become the sin of the world. What does he do? He takes his three guys with him, Peter, James, and John, into the Garden of Gethsemane to pray with him. If Jesus, the Son of God, who is God, surrounded himself with some friends, so should you and so should I. And so that's my first point this morning out of our text is that we never outgrow the need for daily encouragement and interaction with friends. And so just on a practical level, maybe it's time for you to start building some friendships. You might think, well, there's no space for friendships in that friendship circle. It's all on the lockdown. It's just all clicked together. But here's the wonderful truth about the local church. This is the beauty of the local church. Is that as we gather together, like this corporately, as we gather together in our life groups, around something bigger than ourselves, that's the kingdom of God, as we gather around those things, God in His kindness has this way of cultivating just amazing new friendships. We've been in this church about 15 years, and I think of the amazing friendships we've made over those 15 years. But then I think just in the last month, the great new friends that we've made, that we've met during the detox series in our life group, it's been amazing. And so can I encourage you, if you're not a part of a life group, Find a life group, dive into life group. Similarly with any areas of service, bacon and egg teams, the guys at the doors. These are opportunities to go and meet people as we gather together around something bigger than ourselves. When we joined this church, uh, my wife Laura, we sat at the back and coming both from a traditional church, she only made it through half the service and, and bailed us. This is way too big, way too hectic for me. And uh, until we find a life group and we joined Rich and Sandra Pooley's life group, uh, who are here, I'm sure, and... Um, and we became great friends, so much so that in time they actually did our wedding, they officiated our wedding and sewed into our lives and they became friends. And suddenly this giant big church became like a family, became a small church. And so can I encourage you, position yourself available for friendships to happen. That means go and find a life group, go and find somewhere to serve in the local church. You'll be amazed at what God will do and the people that you'll meet. All right, my second point, are we all still there? My second point is Christian friendship requires effort, requires us to be intentional. I love this part of the story with Jonathan and David. Verse 16, it says, Jonathan saw son rose and went to David at Horesh and strengthened his hand in God. Jonathan did not accidentally bump into David while heading out for an afternoon walk. This is out in the desert. They did not have GPS. They did not, he couldn't ping his phone. He had to go and find David. This took effort. Now, on a Sunday morning, after church, if you head to Watercrest Mall, the chances are you're going to bump into a whole lot of people that you know and some friends you might want to rekindle some friendship with. But the friends that you want to build with, that we want to run this race, that want to go the distance, it requires us to be intentional. And I love how intentional 
Jonathan was going to find David. The, uh, I absolutely love war, war movies, and especially when there's Navy SEALs stuck behind enemy lines or guys against the like Gideon against his Midianite army, against his hundreds of thousands, and there's just this incredible victory or this incredible story. And there's one such movie that I wanted to emphasize this point with, and it's a movie called 300. Now, the disclaimer is there are some things in there that won't contribute to detox your mind because there's a little bit of swearing and whatnot, and so that's my disclaimer. You might want to have the fast forward button ready for the odd expletive, but uh, I'm sure we can handle that. But it's a great story, and it's based on a true story. The story goes like this. In, 14, sorry, in 479 BC, King Leonidas refuses to give the Persian, onseeing Persian army some of their land. They came to demand. They want land and, water, land and earth. And he basically says, uh, says to him, no. And in, in quite an interesting way. You've got to watch the movie. I didn't say you should watch the movie. The Spartans decide, right, the only place where we can take on this Persian army who were hundreds and thousands, if not millions, of soldiers with elephants, and they were just kitted up. Due to some political things, King Leonidas couldn't get, didn't have time to rally up the entire army, so he takes 300 of his best men. They were these Spartans, super soldiers. They look like Gav. Gav? They are these super soldiers. These guys were, just spoke about our physical body, that this cheese grater, just grating cheese across your abs. These guys, if you look at the movie, Gerald Butler, I'll tell you what, he went, he did some seriously hard work in the gym and got incredibly fit for the movie. But based on the true story, these 300 guys head out and they realize that the only place for them to take a stand against this oncoming Persian army was at the place called the Hot Gates. Now this was, a, this was like a, a cut in the mountain that opened up onto, onto the coast and they, they were going to use this as their point to take a stand. And, uh, and these Persians would come down and they basically create like a funnel effect that would come down this coastal road, the cliff off on the side and a ledge and the cliff up top. And these guys would come down and they're, and they're coming in their thousands. So they get there early, they build a bit of a rock wall on the one side just to make sure that they've, they've, they've funneled them in correctly. And then they get there ready and they're waiting. While they're waiting, the earth starts to shake. The one captain says, clinging loud us, he says, earthquake, captain, e- earthquake. Uh, and, and he says, no, captain, battle formations. This was the Persian army arriving, was sh- literally shaking the ground. And so the Persians arrive, and uh, the Spartans are in place, and they take their stand, and one Persian shouts out to them. They're looking down, and they say, across this, this, uh, this, this stretch, says, Spartans, lay down your weapons. Guys, why don't you put up that picture? I'll just show what it looks like. Ooh, okay. It says, Spartans, lay down your weapons. And one of the Spartans send one of those spears out from miles away, and it drills this Persian in the chest. End of that Persian. The Persians come running towards him like mad. And, and King Leonidas, who's the guy with the, the Mohawk uh, top uh, helmet there, he says to his men, he says, men, he says, this is where we stand. This is where we fight. And this is where they die. Okay, don't worry about the dying part. <laughs> and then as these guys come running, oh, first he says, you want our weapons? Come get them. Then he says, men, this is where we stand. This is where we fight. And then as these guys come and they're about to take impact, he says, men, Lenio says, give them nothing. Take from them everything. And then there's this engagement. These Persians charge into these Spartans. And these guys are locked in. Their, 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 shield, their shields are locked together. They're impenetrable. And these Persians come running and they're slapping with spears and uh, all sorts, their swords, etc. cetera. And not, not one Spartan gets injured on this particular first engagement. But what happens is as they take the hit, they're leaning together like this, and they, and they slide back about half a meter as they take the hit. They haven't, no one's made a move yet. It's all the Persians going at them like this, and they, t- and they hold. Shh. In the movie, it goes quiet. The United States says, no, nah. on now. They move in one unit. They step forward. Boom. And the front guys lift up their shields and knock the first line of Persians off their kilter. As they do that, the guys behind them send their, send their spears through like this, like a sewing machine needle. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> Knitting needle. And the, first line of, and the first line of Persians drop. But as they do that, it's like, choo-choo. And, and then the shields lock, choo-choo-choo, back in like this. And they lift again, choo-choo, and lock again. And they just start eating through these Persians. Now, what does this have to do with friendship? <laughs> I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> this is what it has to do with friendship. There, there is a life group. Listen carefully to the story. I've had permission to tell the story. There is a life group. He hasn't killed anyone, so don't worry. There's a life group. In this church, three weeks ago, a family in the life group had to take the little girl, little baby girl, down to Cape Town 
for a very scary surgery I had to go through. So they head down to Cape Town. Two people in the life group from different families, while the life group's praying and trusting, they go and buy a plane ticket. They get on a plane. They fly down to Cape Town. When I heard the dad of the little girl tell the story, he's got tears in his eyes telling the story. When he sees his friends arrive in the hospital, and he says, his faith just starts to rise. Ooh. And these guys arrive there. They've come to stand and lock shields with their friends. And here's what happens. As this family takes on the operation, the surgery with the surgeon, they've taken their shield of faith, Ephesians 6. They're standing together. There's a very real enemy, guys, the devil. It says that we get to give the shield of faith to extinguish the arrows of the enemy. How does he work? He comes with fear. He comes with doubt. He comes with anxiety. So while this family have stand, stood like this, and they're taking their stand, we're doing everything we can. They're exposed on the sides. The enemy comes on the sides in their mind. What happens if something goes wrong? What about your little girl? All these thoughts, the arrows of the enemy come. As the arrows are arriving, the friends arrive and lock shields. This is where we stand. This is where we fight. And this is where we don't kill anyone in the hospital. Okay. <laughs> That, that family, that family was blessed like you can't imagine as friends came and locked shields. Those five people you spend the most time with, the pictures of us locking shields. And, and you know what they're saying to the enemy? Give him nothing. We stand together. I'm here to stand with you, brother. As you're fighting for your little girl's life, we trust God for the healing, his power, his hand. It's all about Jesus in that situation. As your brother... I'm making sure that we give the enemy nothing and we stand together and no one dies. And I've lost my place. <laughs> one final story on this. I want you to flick to the next picture. A group of ladies, the lady in the middle top left, sorry, it's a bit blurred. Uh, her name is Katie and she got diagnosed with breast cancer and she's still got her hair. These are all of her friends. On hearing that, she had breast cancer, and as her hair started to fall out, the friends go out and shave their heads beforehand. You read the article, I had tears streaming down my face, read this article, as the friends told the story of having their heads shaved, you see these pictures of them shaving off their beautiful long hair, and they crying in just sympathy and, and faith and love and friendship for their friend, Khadi. That is what locking shields does, and isn't that a cool picture? Just the picture before was the Spartan army locking shields. This is how we need to value friendship. It's the same, side by side, locking shields, looking after each other. Proverbs 17, listen to this. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. A surgery on your little girl is a time of adversity. When we lock shields together, we become like brothers and sisters in the kingdom of God. We, become, we lock shields, it becomes tight, it becomes this fortified front. We protect each other. Proverbs 18, 24 says, one who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. We get this great privilege, guys, to get called out by God. His, his love and grace and mercy saves us. He then sets us on this incredible journey, and we realize, man, he's planned out this amazing life for me. He says, don't go it alone. There's adventures to have. There's mountains to climb together. Lock shields with each other. Find those friends that can stick closer than a brother. If you don't want to be that person stuck in that canyon under a boulder, be that person who hops on a plane, makes a meal, drops off some flowers, drops a phone call. We are intentional about these relationships. How intentional are you? How dangerous is that we can rely, wait for our friends to be intentional towards us? Can I say, don't worry about what they're doing. You can only be in control of yourself. Make a choice. Make the first move. You'll see at the end we talk about the friendship with Jesus. Jesus made the first move towards us. And we'll talk about that. I don't want to ruin my last point. But we get this opportunity. So can I ask this? Why don't you think of some people you could be intentional with? If friendship is something God has given us to charge the mountain, you've got to know the enemy isn't pleased with these friendships. He doesn't want them to exist. And so the reality is as human beings, being human, which I assume all of you are, there's a chance that friendships, some friendships, the wheels have come off. Someone's offended you. Someone's upset you. Due to circumstances, silly things get said. Can I tell you what? The, the enemy would just love to destroy and devour any friendships that drive you towards Jesus. He wouldn't be much of an enemy if he didn't. And so 
can I, can I say this as well? While being intentional to go and love and build into those friendships, there might be friendships where the locusts have come and destroyed them. The enemy has come and robbed them. You might want to list a couple of names on your page now of some friendships you need to go and take the ground back. Like those Spartans who got hit back a little bit and they started taking ground again. Go and take some ground back. Go invite someone for coffee. Take them out for lunch. Buy them a nice cap like Hutch's one. Bless, bless someone. Go out of your way. And, these to- and, and just pick up with our, our thing of detox, the toxins we've got to be careful of. Jonathan, in the story of Jonathan and David, Jonathan had every reason to envy and hate David as well. Just think about it. You're the son of the king, the current king. One would think, well, possibly I might at some point become king. No, no, no. An outsider comes in, highly favored, kills the giant. Everyone loves him. He's the golden boy. I actually don't know how Jonathan did not resent David and want to actually join his dad in taking him out. But they'd valued and put friendship ahead of all those things. So we've got to be careful of jealousy, envy, comparison, unforgiveness, unfair expectations on each other. These are the toxins that the enemy uses to destroy our friendships. Colossians 3, 12 to 14. I'm just going to pick up verse 13 out of the texture. Um, Okay, you won't see where it is. I'll, I'll read it out to you. That's starting at verse 12. It says in verse 13, Bear with each other. Forgive one another if anyone has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. So can I encourage you, some, just a practical application of this point. List down some friends that you could go and be more intentional with, and then some friends that you need to go and repair some friendships with. You never know, like those friends who so kindly were waiting for me after my trick, you never know what impact and how crucial those friendships are going to be in your walk with Jesus. At this point, I'd like to just mention this week's challenge. So we did the social media challenge. We've done uh, what we speak and this week's challenge, uh, which will come up in your, in your life groups, is a, a no gossip challenge. The challenge is this, for seven days, is if you are talking to someone else about someone else negatively, that you stop, you apologize to the person you're speaking to, and change direction in the conversation. That's this week's challenge. I'm just throwing it out there now. Your life group leaders will remind you of that. All right, my third point with regards to Jonathan and David, it's a short one, is that Jonathan strengthened it strengthened each other in God. Jonathan did not go out to David to strengthen David's self-confidence. This is critical, guys. The type of friendships we have, Jonathan did not go out to David to strengthen his self-confidence. He went out to strengthen David's confidence in God. He went out to strengthen David in God. He could have said, Dory, rely on me, brother. I'll be, I'll, I'm, I'm here for you. No, no, no. Let me remind you of what God has called you to. This is how we strengthen each other. We remind each other of the promises of God on your life. We see it here in verse 17. Fear not, Jonathan says, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. Here's the critical thing. You shall be king over Israel, and I will be, shall be next to you. My, Saul, my father, knows this as well. He reminds him. He reminds him of what God has called him to. I mentioned when, when David was 15 years old, uh, God, God appoints David through the prophet Samuel, as the next king over all of Israel. Jonathan goes out and reminds him, says, David, while you're out hiding in the desert, while you, all the stuff's just raging on, the storm of your life's raging on, he goes and reminds him, says, hey, Jonathan, hey, David, don't forget, you are the next king of Israel. He reminds him of the call of God over his life. This morning when we had worship, we remind ourselves of the promises of God. Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. I'm here to set the captives free. We remind each other of the call of of God on our lives. I've got a particular friend, it's actually my tall friend here, Gav, and uh, seems to be just the same, I might as well mention your name, but um, I love it when I meet up with Gav for a coffee. It's like this unspoken rule. We, we haven't ever spoken about it, but I was, in preparing this, I realized it's like this unspoken rule. No small talking, no small talk, thinking, no small thinking. It's like, are we still charging the mountain? What's God doing? What are you asking God for? What has God just done? What can we celebrate? How big's a dream? No, 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 no. Aim bigger. How big, what are you playing? No, 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 no. go bigger. Why? Because we serve a big God. What has God called you to? Now, it's not being unrealistic. It's about pointing each other to Jesus, pointing ourselves to God and the plans that he has for us. And this should be the biggest distinguishing factor between these five people you choose to spend the most time with and like your sports, club, your sports club buddies and your surf buddies, is that these guys point you to Jesus. Proverbs 27 verse 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, 
so one person sharpens another. And, I, and off the back of that, these friendships you're talking about, this friendship that I have with Gav, for example, when we get together, actually, I, I, in, in reading this, this particular message written by someone else, there was a statement there that says, the friendships we're looking for to drive us towards the things of God are forged in the fire of two convictions, two pillars. Number one, Jesus alone can satisfy the soul. And number two, his kingdom alone is worth living for. Jonathan goes out to David. He says, David, I can't strengthen you basically, but God, find strength in God. Our friendships should be, should be based on this foundation, this conviction. I love it, the forged in the fire of this conviction that Jesus alone can satisfy your soul. And his kingdom alone is worth living for. So if you have friendships, the counter that would be, hey, you know what, you're just such a legend. Rely on yourself. Don't worry about asking God about that. And you know what, why don't we just build our own kingdoms? Let's just try and get as rich as possible and have as many toys as possible. Just, just serve yourself. No, 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 no. Jesus alone can satisfy the soul. His kingdom alone is worth living for. That's like the foundation. So those five people you spend, if you were to think of the five guys or girls that you spend the most time with, and to hold up those two questions, do we, do, is this centered around this idea that Christ alone can satisfy my soul and his kingdom alone is something, that I, is something we are living for? It's a good question to ask ourselves. A comment on that and the beauty of the local church is that we don't have to have friendships who are just the same age. Gavin and I are the same age. We can have friendships that are older than us, friendships that are younger than us. There's a great proverb in thir- chapter 13, verse 20, Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffer harm. There's people, there's, pe- there's, there's friends you could in- friendships you could initiate with people that are maybe older and wiser or just know more about stuff than you. You might want to look around and say, man, there's something about that guy's life that I admire and I would love to see in my life. Best I go and have some coffee with that guy. Best I initiate some friendships with those type of people. Similarly, as a local church, as we are receiving from people, so we should be giving down to other people. Someone coming through, looking down into the youth, looking into people in the generation below you. Who am I pulling through? Who can I sow some of the things I've learned into them? We don't have to look far in a local church for opportunities to do that. And so can I encourage you guys, is for us to check in on our friendships. Those five, are they pointing you to Jesus or are they pointing you to yourself and the rest of the world? My fourth and final point, and uh, just looking at the time, if uh, Dylan and the worship team, it would be great to sing a song in our last kind of five minutes, just to give you guys a heads up. But our, my fourth and final point uh, is a friendship everyone needs. Now, just to clarify that, why it's different to my first three points. The first three points, we're talking about the friendships we get to choose. Now, this is a choice as well, but this is a friendship everyone needs. While looking at the type of friendships that launch us forward into the things that God has for us, there's a friendship that we need for that to happen. I made the statement earlier, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Well, there's a friend that not only has the greatest possible impact and influence into your future, into your life, but there's a friend that holds your future in the palm of his hands, and his name is Jesus Christ. There's a beautiful text, which I would encourage you, if you haven't been taking notes, find some way of jotting this, this text down. It's from John 15, 12 to 15. John 15, 12 to 15. And it's the most beautiful text. It's something that over the last couple of weeks, I have just going over it a few times, I've just had my own revelation several times of just how kind and loving Jesus is. And so just to take you through this step by step, it says this in verse 12, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. And here it is, verse 13, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. I was going to pause there. What Jesus is saying, he's saying, I have loved you with the greatest love. Ephesians 3 says, this love is so wide and so high and so deep. Holy Spirit, help us just to grasp the width and the depth and the heart of this love. Jesus is saying this text, I have loved you with the greatest possible love. I proved it to you. I demonstrated it to you by giving my life for you, by taking your sin upon me. It says, while we were still sinners, Christ dies for us to demonstrate, to prove his love for us. So he's saying this, oh, this, this, this text, I've loved you with the greatest love. I've shown you that by the way, I've given my life for you. And here's the amazing thing he says, you are my friends if you do what I command. 
I'm just going to pause there as well because I don't want anyone to, to lose the heart of this, this, this verse 14. You are my friends if I do what I command. Now, what Jesus is not saying, he's not saying, do what I command and then I'll make you my friend and I'll love you. No, I love you with the greatest love. You are my friend precedes if you do what I command. Do you see that? It comes before. He says, I love you with the greatest possible love. You can't even imagine it. Your brain's too small to grasp it. I'm going to help you as much as I can with my Holy Spirit. I've loved you the greatest love. I'll call you friends. And the fruit of that friendship, the resulting outworking in our lives, that we would do everything we can to do series like detox and live according to the Word of God and become more like Christ. It's the fruit of the friendship. I love you the greatest love. I laid my life down for you. The fruit of that as we walk in that with Jesus as His friends is we start to live according to His Word. We make decisions for our lives to become more like Him. Verse 15, no longer do I call you servants because a servant does not know as far as master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I've made known to you. This is beautiful. What is he referring to when I say everything, I, I, everything you need to know, I've made known to you? It's not all the mysteries of the kingdom. Our brains are too small to even start to grasp that. What he's saying is, he's, he's referring to what he's just spoken about. I've made everything known to you in order to walk according to the word of God. I've made everything known to you about the father. It's like this beautiful picture of a father and son. I take my son and Brody. Brody brings home a friend. Brody has full access to me as his father. He brings his friend home and he says, now this friend, I want to give you access to my dad as well. But with Jesus and with God the father, it's it's a whole lot deeper than that. So, So the son brings home us. Jesus brings us home. He saves us. He brings us home and he says, and He's got full access to the Father. We don't. Jesus brings us home and he, and he says, now I'll give you full access to the Father and everything that the Father has. I give you full access. I invite you in. And the beauty of our relationship with Jesus is as we accept the sacrifice, as we accept his love and grace and forgiveness, he, he makes us friends and he pulls us into the family and we become sons in the family of God. Isn't that good news? Isn't that amazing news? The race marked out for us is this journey of being pulled in by Jesus as a friend. He extends his hand of friendship to us, saying, I've loved you with the greatest love. You can't even imagine. I, laid my, I gave my life to you. I bought you. I, I set you free. I paid for your life. I was the sacrifice. I got crushed on your behalf to, to make you friends. And I now call you my friend because I've made known to you everything about my father. I've introduced you to the father. And we get to live as sons with him in the father's house. It's a beautiful thing. Charles Spurgeon uh, once said, oh, to be able to say Christ is my friend is one of the sweetest things in the world. To be known by Christ or to know Christ and be known by him, friends, is the greatest gift we could ever receive in this life. And so in close, I'd like to share one final story about a Navy SEAL, Michael Monsieur. He had distinguished himself by always going beyond the call of duty. He was a combat advisor and automatic weapons gunner for the Naval Special War Fair Task Group. Isn't that a cool title? Isn't that they say, hi there, this is Melville Timlet. He was an automatic weapons gunner for the Naval Special War Fair Task Group unit. I mean, Mel, shoulders back, chest out, King Leonidas, and we're off. He was part of the Delta Platoon. He was sent to Iraq in 2006 and assigned to train Iraqi soldiers in Ramadi. Over the next five months, Monsieur and his platoon frequently engaged in in combat with insurgent forces. On the 29th of September 2006, during one such engagement, an insurgent threw a grenade onto a rooftop where Monsieur and several of his Navy SEAL buddies and Iraqi soldiers were positioned. Of everyone on the rooftop, Monsieur was the only guy with an avenue of escape, which was directly behind him off the rooftop and away from the blast. He could have made a few, taken a few steps back and be out of harm's way. Instead, Monsieur calls out grenade, realizes his friends, there's no ways to get off the roof. Every one of them would die. Monsieur dives forward onto the grenade as it detonates. He took the, he took the full impact and explosion of that grenade onto himself. It was said that this selfless and clearly intentional act of courage saved the lives of everyone on that rooftop. In the same way, Jesus Christ chose 
to intentionally dive onto the grenade of our sin and ensuing punishment and explosion of the wrath that was coming towards us. He dives onto our sin, this grenade, our grenade of sin, and he takes the full impact and weight of it onto himself on the cross and pays for our lives, an atoning sacrifice. Similar to the story, it was clearly intentional. It was a choice that he made for us to become the sin of the world, to be crushed, beaten, betrayed, mocked, and brutally crucified, not just to save a few on a rooftop, but to save everyone on this earth. Today, he extends a hand of friendship to every single one of us, saying, I've loved you with the greatest love. I've given my life for you. If you would just accept me into your heart, if you would allow me to show you the plans I have for you, you would be saved. I'd introduce you to the Father. There's a life planned for you. And he extends his hand of friendship to us. In the very beginning, we spoke about the friends we choose. Can I encourage you this morning, if you have not put your faith in Christ, or you've been following God for some time, but have not just not realized this depth of friendship Christ extends to us, choose to remind yourself today. Choose to make a commitment to Him today.